let's begin and let's look. I do want us in the flow of John. So be bored for a moment if need be. But John did not chop his book up verse by verse. The verses were added later. John's got segmented thought. But we need to be in the flow of the way John wrote it. So let's just look at the last couple of verses and see where we were. This is John 1, 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Then John continues with a theme of life and light. In Him, the Word, was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Then he moves into a thought of John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. John goes into more detail on the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And this moves us to where we ended last week with verse 14, where John says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now last week we started with this verse 14. We picked up the reading this week with another aspect. So last week when we looked at it, we looked at how John says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I talked to you last week about that word dwelt because our readings that went with it were readings about the tabernacle the instructions for how to build the tabernacle, the specificity that went with those instructions, the work of God's Spirit in imbuing the craftsman with the necessary skill set to do the work. And we talked about that because the word dwelt that's used there is the word from, from the Greek skeno, skeno, skenoo, except that's Lubbock pronunciation, and someone's going to correct me like geezer. So I better say it, instead of skenoo, say skenao, uh, with the uh, um, omicron as opposed to the omega. We have too many scholars. I have to be careful. <laughs> anyway, that word means to pitch your tent. It's in third person singular form. But he pitched his tent which is what the tabernacle was. So John is invoking this image of the tabernacle. The tabernacle, you'll recall, as the exodus is taking place, Moses is instructed to build a tabernacle as the place where the Lord would descend and meet with Moses and be in the presence of the people. It was the tabernacle where the sacrifices would be offered or within the courtyard enclosure of it at least. And so this is, this is what John's drawing on when John says the Word, God, became flesh and dwelt among us. He pitched His tent. He tabernacled among us. And then we've got this part that we did not touch last week, but was in Monday's reading of, of, of uh, this week we've just finished. And... We have seen His glory. Now I paused and dedicated a day of our reading to that because we can't follow what John's talking about 
if we don't go back and refresh the Old Testament story. John is basically echoing some Old Testament passage here to say the word tabernacled and we have seen his glory. Look at uh, uh, the Moses story again. Let's look at it with Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 33, we have a, a, a very clear passage that John is referencing. If we can go to the Elmo, please. Exodus 33. So, to put us in the flow of things, this is the command to leave Sinai. Yahweh says to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you've brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it, and I'll drive everyone out, and you'll be there. But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. No one put on his ornaments. The Lord had said to Moses, say to the people, you're a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onwards. They, quitted, they, they quit thinking of themselves as something spectacular. They were in all of their finery. Now, Moses used to take the tent. Now we're in the flow. We're in the context. We've got it set up. Now find the echoes of John here. John says, The Word pitched his tent and dwelt among us, or pitched his tent among us, and we beheld his glory. Find the echo. Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. Everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door. They'd watch Moses until Moses had gone into the tent. Moses got to go into this tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and Yahweh would speak with Moses. And when the people saw the pillar of the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. The tent would be pitched, and when the cloud descended and the glory of the Lord came into the tent, it moved the people to worship. We're already getting an echo of what John expects us to do with Jesus. The word who pitched his tent and we beheld his glory is something that should be moving people to worship. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. Now that does not mean Moses seeing the face of God, but it's a reference to God speaking to him the way we would talk friend to friend. And, and the writer makes it clear, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Now, Moses intercedes for the people here. He says to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you'll send with me. So, if I've found favor in your sight, show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. I want you to hear all of these echoes because John is clearly reflecting this passage. If you don't see it yet, you will by the time we're through. So when John reflects this passage, he wants these echoes in your mind. He's writing to people whose Bible was what we call the Old Testament. Jewish scriptures were their scriptures. If I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways. John's saying in Jesus we see the ways of God. Consider too this nation is your people. And God said, my presence will go with you. I'll give you rest. 
And he said, and Moses says to God, if your presence will not go with me, don't bring us from here. How will people know I've got your sight? For how shall it be known I found favor? Now look at verse 17. The Lord said to Moses, This very thing you've spoken I will do because you found favor in my sight. Moses said, Please show me your glory. Now here we've got John. Keep it in mind. The word pitched his tent, tabernacled among us, and we have beheld his glory. Now Moses had the tent pitched, and the glory of the Lord descended as a cloud. But Moses specifically asked the Lord, would you show me your glory? And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And you will proclaim, and I, and I will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. But you can't see my face. For man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. Yeah. Get it up there. And while my glory passes by, I'll put you in a cleft of the rock and I'll cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll take away my hand. You'll see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And we continued that reading. So we read Exodus 33. And if I had continued into Exodus 34, after the glory of the Lord, and I didn't because it's saved for another day, but after the glory of the Lord, Moses doesn't behold God in all of his glory. But still, after God passes by, Moses, just seeing the, the, the back of God's glory, his face shines so brightly. Moses' face shines so brightly that they have to cover him with a veil because the Israelites can't bear to look upon his face. Now this is what John is saying happened with Jesus. The word tabernacled and we have seen his glory. When the word, when Jesus was made flesh, John was explaining that this was God's showing his glory and dwelling among men. And it's his echo. Now I switched us from there to Exodus chapter 40. In Exodus chapter 40, we have again Moses erecting the tabernacle. And he does it in all of the ways he can do it. And Exodus 40 ends after the tabernacle's been erected. It's the last chapter of Exodus. With verse 34. After they've erected the tent, the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because of that. And throughout all their journeys, wherever the cloud was taken, whenever the cloud was taken up, the people of Israel would set out. If the cloud was not taken up, they didn't set out. And that's how they did their journey. The glory of the Lord in the tabernacle was something that guided the daily lives of the Israelites. And that is another echo that John has for us in his gospel when he says the word became flesh or pitched his tent, dwelt among us, we and we have beheld his glory. Now, Psalm 67 we added to the reading. It's, it's a marvelous psalm because it's a psalm that has a reflection of another blessing that's contained in Numbers. The blessing is uh, echoed in this psalm or repeated in this psalm in the first verse. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Now, if you've been in our class for long, we've talked about the parallelism of Hebrew poetry. That what marked Hebrew poetry was not saying things in rhyme, it was not some iambic pentameter rhythm. 
but it was saying things in couplets where the second couplet echoes the first couplet in a way that provides a greater depth of meaning. It might be by adding to it. It might be by simply putting another face on it. Sometimes it's even by saying the exact opposite. But that's what earmarks Hebrew poetry. And if we look at this couplet here in that light, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Because those are two ways of expressing the same thing. God to be gracious to us, God to bless us, is for God to make his face shine upon us. And we put it here as an echo of John and a con context for John, because for John, when Jesus, the Word, becomes flesh and we behold His glory, it is God's most gracious blessing upon us as His face shines upon us. And the shine, of course, echoes earlier John where he speaks of Jesus being the light. Then we finish the reading um, with uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 16. Now, 1 Chronicles chapter 16 is where the ark, David's recapturing, got the ark, and he's placing it in the tent. He's brought the ark to Jerusalem, and they bring in the ark of God, and they set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. This is no longer the original tabernacle that had been built in the wilderness, but David pitches a tent for the ark. They offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. Now, if we go down to verse, David sings a song of thanks. If we go down to verse 27 in this song that David sings, we read the following. Splendor and, uh, well, the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. By the way, it's Hebrew poetry. You see the couplet. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. With the ark, or with the tent pitched and the ark in its presence, David's song is much like John's. There we find the glory of the Lord. There we find the strength of the Lord. There we're moved to worship, ascribing to him the glory due his name. Name not meaning uh, uh, a label as much as it means who he truly is and what he had done for the people his reputations and his so, deeds. John continues, and now John moves from this story of, that echoes Moses in the wilderness to another aspect of Moses. Moses is still in John's mind as he's writing this and still in our conversation. So John continues and says, For from his fullness, the fullness of the word, the fullness of Jesus, we have all received grace upon grace. Again, an echo of David's song that we just looked at in 1 Chronicles 16. Grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now look at the way he does this. He contrasts Moses and the law with Jesus and grace and truth. We'll start out with Moses and the law. So Moses and the law. Exodus 19 through 20 and 32 detail Moses receiving the law. So we read that. Moses received it. He's on Mount Sinai. If you were at the uh, uh, seminar over the weekend and you heard Jim Hoffmeyer, famed Egyptologist last night, he told you where Mount Sinai is not. Didn't know where it was, but he knows where it's not. Gave us some candidates. 
So in Exodus 19 through 20 and in Exodus 32, we read about Moses receiving the law from God. But just as much as that's found in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, we also find an indication that something else is coming. We find what uh, uh, we put in Zechariah 12. In Zechariah 12, we have what's called a messianic passage. Messianic meaning uh, uh, speaks of a time where the Messiah, the anointed, would be coming. At least that's the way this passage is understood by the church. And the way it was understood in the Talmud, which the written Talmud wasn't written down until about 200 or so A.D., but the Talmud reflects teaching, rabbinical teaching, that existed centuries before that. So the church was not alone in assigning this passage to what God would be doing in the Messianic age, in the age of the anointed. Look what it says. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth. You, by the way, the reason we started with John 1.1 1, 1 and kept in the flow is because you need to hear and I need to hear the echoes of John, even the passages we've already covered, when we look through here. Because it's not just one echo. When John speaks of in the beginning was the word and nothing was made without the word and the world was formed throughout the, through the word, he's giving echo to an idea and language that we read here. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I'm about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will hurt themselves. All the nations of the earth will gather against it. On that day, I'll strike every horse with panic, its rider with madness. We keep going. And uh, Jerusalem certainly had their fair share of problems like this. Um, now, let's keep going. And the Lord will give salvation to the tents of Judah first. Just the echoing of these words. To the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem may not surpass that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Judah so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. On that day, I'll seek to destroy all the nations that have come against Jerusalem. Now, here's the messianic passage. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace. Another word echoed in John. Grace upon grace. And pleas for mercy. So that when they look on me, this is God speaking, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. When John writes about Moses and the law, he contrasts it with Jesus and grace. It's a messianic idea that a spirit of grace will come when the people look upon God on him whom they have pierced. The church saw this, early church saw this, the New Testament writes this in Revelation as well, 
also written by John, as a reference to Jesus who was pierced for our transgressions, by whose stripes we are healed. So we looked at that and then we went a little further and we went ahead and grabbed some of Paul. Paul, a rabbinically trained at the feet of Gamaliel, a Pharisee, was writing to the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10. And see what he says about Jesus and grace. Hmm. There we go. You were dead. Not sick. <laughs> Not ill. Dead. In your trespasses and sins. In which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now at work in sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, another word used in Zechariah 12, because of the great love with which he loved us, even as we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And this, by grace, you've been saved. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us, in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This isn't your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of works. No one's got any right to be boasting about it. We're his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good works. As Pastor David said this morning, for a reason. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so that concluded our reading on Tuesday. Now we moved into Wednesday and Wednesday we stayed with this idea of Moses receiving the law but it's grace and truth that came through Jesus Christ. So we looked at truth on this day. Jesus and truth. For this reading we went to Matthew 4 which has Jesus in the wilderness. Now we've got the wilderness idea already in John because Moses and all of this exodus that we've been looking at is something that's happening in the wilderness. So we took this as an opportunity to talk about the temptations of Jesus in Matthew 4, which John does not record directly. But they're marvelous for us to look at at this point in time, which is why we did. There are multiple temptations. Now remember the story. Jesus goes out into the wilderness and he goes without bread and water for 40 days. Now the scientists among you, the doctors among you, the nurses among you, and those who have spent half a day in the wilderness among you are going to say, that is impossible. The Bible must be wrong. No one can physically be in the wilderness 40 days without anything to eat and anything to drink. To which I have two answers. Number one, God can do miracles. Number two, 40 doesn't always mean 40. 40's got some significance beyond 40. So you take your pick on either one, or it can be a twofer. You can have them both. But 40 days is a strong echo that Matthew wants us to have of the 40 years in the wilderness that the Jews spent because they succumbed to temptation. So Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness and then Satan comes up to tempt him. The first temptation is what, as Matthew gives it? Hey buddy, you got to be hungry. Why don't you turn these rocks into bread? Have some food, and then we'll get on about our business. The first temptation echoes God's miracle of manna in the wilderness. 
God made manna in the wilderness. God fed the people. You're hungry. Make yourself some manna. Turn the rocks into bread. If you're the son of God, that's an that's a easy one. That's a gimme. Jesus replies with a wilderness lesson from Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8 verses 1 through 3 is where we turn. Jesus quotes scripture to Satan. Here's what Deuteronomy 1 says. I mean 8, 1. If we go to the Elmo, please. Let's see if we can get it up there. Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 3. The whole commandment that I command you today you'll be careful to do. This is Moses talking that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that Yahweh swore to give to your fathers. You'll remember the whole way that the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger, and then he fed you with manna, which you did not know, which your fathers did not know, that he might make you know man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. So Jesus says, yes, God made manna, God provided it, but the reason God did is so that you would know that you don't live by bread alone, you rely upon the God who gives the bread. And you live by the word of the Lord and what God provides. So if we go back to the PowerPoint. So, yes, tempt me to make bread, but I'm not interested in following your temptations. I'm not interested in sating my personal hunger. I'm going to follow the word of the Lord. It's a marvelous reply. So now Satan gets into the quote scripture game. Whoops. Ah, there we go. We've got temptation number two. Satan gets into the quote scripture game. And he quotes Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12. So we read Psalm 91. And he tells Jesus in essence, hey, throw yourself down because the psalm says that the angels will bear you up and God will protect his anointed. It's roughly akin to the people today who say, well, I may be sick, but I'm not going to the doctor. If God wants me healed, he can heal me himself. Jesus says, that's not the way we do things. You're not, you're not a puppet that God's pulling strings on. You are a free-willing human being who makes your decisions. You can choose to walk in what God's got for you or choose not to. And so the reply of Jesus is again a Deuteronomy passage that says you don't tempt God, you don't test God. The goal behind this is not for me to go into the wilderness so I can prove God. Then Satan offers Jesus the world. And Jesus' reply is, no, you worship God and Him alone. So we read through that. Then we continued with John. And we went at this point into John 1, 19 through 28. Now this is the John the Baptist passage that Pastor David spent time with today. In the John the Baptist passage, if you were in service, you got to hear this. But one of the things John was asked is, you know, the, 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 the priests and the Levites come out to question John. Now John is a priest, in a, well he's not a priest, but he's a Levite. His daddy was a priest. He's part of the Levitical priesthood. So they send out his relatives of sort to get the lowdown on it. And they say, who are you? He says, let me be clear, I'm not the Christ. They said, well, are you Elijah? Now that's not because he rode around in a fiery chariot. That's for a different reason. So we read some about John the Baptist and Elijah. In addition to the John passage, I took you to 1 Kings 21. That's Naboth's vineyard. That's where Nab uh, King Ahab really wants Naboth's vineyard, but Naboth won't sell it to him. 
So Ahab's whining about it to his wife, who wore the pants in the family. That's apparent. And she says, oh, just don't worry about it. I'll get it for you. She has Naboth killed, and the king gets the vineyard. And Elijah sends a word of rebuke and judgment upon the king, at which point the king actually repents. And Elijah says, I'll bring the judgment on your children, not on you. Then we had another story from Elijah out of 2 Kings 1, 2, 1, 1 through 2, 14, where King Ahaziah is trying to figure out if his sickness is going to kill him. So he wants Elijah to come tell him. Sends an army of 50 men. And they're going to bring Elijah. And Elijah just says, no, just go tell him. He's, he's, uh, this, is, this is the answer. He's in trouble. And, and, and they said, no, you've got to come with us. So, so the Lord comes down just destroys the army. Or the, the battalion, we'll call it, of 50 men. So the king sends a second troop. Same thing. Sends a third troop. Same thing is starting to unfold, but the captain of the third troop, knowing what had happened to the earlier two troops, says, listen, if you send me back without, I'm going to like get killed. I know the way this thing goes down. We've seen this movie before. Can you please come? Because I don't want to die. And Elijah says yes, and Elijah goes and delivers the word of the Lord. Elijah dies. He's caught up in a chariot. And so the Jews have this idea that Elijah, who left in a chariot, could always come back. And Elijah became a, a symbol, a, a name associated with God sending someone in the spirit of Elijah. And that's what we got in the Malachi 4 reading. It's the reading that gives us the expectation of the Jews that caused them to be asking John the Baptist, Are you Elijah? Malachi 4 happens to be the last chapter in the Old Testament as the church has put the scripture together. But in the process of it, the day is coming, burning like an oven when the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming, shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. It will leave them neither root nor branch. You'll fear my name. The Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. You'll go leaping like calves from the stall. You'll tread down the wicked. Verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers. He will teach people repentance to turn around, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And thus ends Malachi. So Malachi says, with this great and awesome day of the Lord, Elijah will come first. And the people wanted to know, are you claiming to be Elijah? John says, no. In fact, Jesus says, John was wrong in another passage that we'll get to later. And Jesus says, John the Baptist was an Elijah of sorts. But, be that as it may, we end with Elijah pointing to Jesus. We've got nine minutes to get this last day's reading out. We end with Elijah pointing to Jesus, saying, Oh, 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 this is actually Monday's reading. Okay, sorry. But I have to put it in here. It just fits too well. So Elijah ends by saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, I love this passage. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How many of you drive? All right, those of you who drive, how many know the difference between a stop sign and a speed limit sign? I'm seeing the same hands, which I might add is a good thing. We know the difference. If I were to send you to the store, and say, you would be my best friend for a year if you would get me a Diet Dr. Pepper. How many of you know the difference between a Diet Dr. Pepper and a Coca-Cola? Good. See, we know that. We live with it. 
We've got at least one Jewish scholar in our midst. There may be more. Or else I would say, I bet you 90% of us don't know this. Maybe all of us aren't that familiar with it. But there were lots of things people sacrificed for lots of reasons. And because we're not in a sacrificial system where we bring sacrifices today, we're not very familiar with it. So when we read the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, we think about, oh, that's a, a reference to the, the Lamb that sacrificed for sins. Okay, John knows this stuff cold. His daddy was a priest. He lives in a sacrificial age where they take sacrifices for different things. When he points to Jesus as a male and says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he's not talking... Whoa, go back. Um, okay, that did not animate well. I'm sorry. Okay, just... we got to build this slide together. I messed up on the animation. I apologize. You may be thinking... Day of Atonement. Yes, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And on the Day of Atonement, the hands of the priests are put on the goat, not lamb. It's the difference between mutton and cabrito. Goat and lamb is different. John doesn't say the scapegoat that we have on Yom Kippur. John says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, we read then Leviticus 4 and 5, which sets up all of these different sacrifices for sin. Male goat is the typical sin offering, not male lamb. For some niche, a female lamb can be offered. For the priest, it's a bull that's offered for their sins. For a significant community leader, it's a male goat. For an ordinary person, it's a female goat. The lamb of God, that's a male lamb that takes away the sin of the world, Exodus 12, the Passover. That's where they were told to take a male lamb without blemish. Now don't get me wrong. You find a picture of Jesus in the scapegoat of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And the writer of Hebrews will make that comparison. But the one that John the Baptist was making was not one of that. He's talking about the Passover lamb. He's talking about the lamb that will be slain, whose blood will be over the lintel and the doorpost, so that the angel of death will pass over as the people who live under the blood of that lamb are taken out of bondage through the Red Sea into the promised land. And that's what John's referencing. So, as we look at these things, I hope that this is making some sense to you as you read it along. Fearing that it may not, and recognizing that I've gotten a few emails from people saying, it didn't make any sense to me. I've started trying to tweak it a little bit. And my tweaks did not make the Lesson 3 handout, but if you've got the handout for next week, starting with Lesson 4, I'm going to give you about one sentence each day to tell you why the context scriptures are there to help you. I urge you to read along. I urge you to have questions. I urge you to write your questions or circle your questions. Urge you to stay involved in this as we continue the journey. Thank you. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father and our God, we... Uh, stand and sit amazed amazed at your love amazed at your provision amazed at your unity not only the oneness 
that you have, but the oneness of your word, the oneness of your revelation, the oneness of your scripture. With many parts and, and, and diversities within it, but Lord, with a constant drumbeat and theme. And I pray that we'll hear that drumbeat, we'll hear that theme, and acknowledge you, not only as creator, but as one who has called us into intimate fellowship, ensuring through your love and provision that we have every reason and every confidence to be before you now through the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. As we stand under the blood, Father, would you bless the time we're spending in this class and those who satellite out from what we're about. Bless us with a greater appreciation for your word that as it goes forth among us, it will bear fruit. We pray these things. Amen.